Some fantastic um, uh, talks there, giving us an awful lot of, uh, of thought, uh, promotion really, uh, on the various things. I'm going to sort of uh, go a little bit further in terms of the te technical side of where innovation is going to take us and why leadership is going to be really important to all of us uh, going forward, certainly in manufacturing. Before I do that, I just want to make sure with, with Peter's hobnob story, that it wasn't a Siemens control system that was causing the problem. Um, <laughs> thank God for that. But um, so I head up our um, food and beverage business, automation business for, for UK and Ireland. Uh, I've been in the, the automation business since far too long, uh, 86 or something like that. So uh, I've been around uh, for quite some time. Um, but what I wanted to try and do really is just to, to start really um, with a little bit about, um, about Siemens um, because, there we go. Uh, this isn't our latest MD, by the way. This is a, a guy called William Siemens, actually. He came to the UK in 1843, and it's a, a, a contention uh, that we have with our colleagues in Germany, actually, because uh, Siemens UK started two years before Siemens Germany. So, uh, so that's, a, that's a, a, an important point to make. So our roots are absolutely here in, in the UK. Um, William Siemens was instrumental in putting the electrification part of the Industrial Revolution, if you like. He, it was the first street lighting in Godalming in Surrey, uh, the first uh, uh, auto dial telegraph, um, the, uh, the, the first warning uh, bell for uh, warning people, locomotives that the, the trains were coming down the track, and the first electric train in Bush Mills uh, in Northern Ireland. So uh, he had an awful lot of what I think we need more of, really. He came here because this was where it was happening. This was where inventions were starting to take place. The country took it on board and started to have that ambition, vision, and ingenuity. And I think the leadership discussions that we've already discussed about the, the things that we need to do, I think these are the sort of things that we have to have that trait if we're going to make the most of the technology uh, that's going forward. He, he, he married a Scot. And uh, he was uh, knighted by Queen Victoria, uh, Sir William Siemens. A few months later, unfortunately, he died. I'm not too sure whether it's because of the knighthood that he, uh, he keeled over, but, uh, but it was uh, obviously very prestigious. And he's actually buried in uh, Kensal Green Cemetery here in London. So I'm sure not many people realize that we go back as Siemens that far. And that DNA is absolutely here with us still. We have. We have now 14 manufacturing facilities here in the UK. Our 14th was opened yesterday in uh, Greenport Hall, uh, the wind turbine facility that is now at 160 million pounds with investment gone into the area to develop that uh, wind energy. Uh, and we employ almost 14,000 people here in the UK. Most of you guys, I'm sure, will be familiar with what we do in, in terms of automation. Uh, that is still our biggest part of, of what we're doing. Uh, but uh, it, we are supporting the UK economy uh, with that investment. Uh, but as a manufacturer, of course, we, we, we understand, like you guys, how difficult it is to manufacture in the UK and what we have to do. And so we've mentioned earlier that the, this, the, 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 uh, the skills agenda is absolutely paramount to that, whether it is getting the apprentices, but also retraining and training going through to make sure we close the gap on that skills agenda. And we employ 500 UK engineering apprenticeships across all of our businesses. And we actually manage a lot of our customers and supply chain um, apprentices as well, because to be quite frank, unless we've got the supply chain that can actually take the technology on board, then as a company, we're pretty dead in the water. And I suggest that in the future with the technology race that's going on, if companies like Siemens are struggling in a very technical age, then the UK manufacturing will also be struggling also. So, um, and this commitment that we have got, I need to uh, refresh my, my picture. Uh, ho hopefully, Tom, hopefully Tom can uh, assist in getting us uh, contacts with, a, with a, another level of uh, uh, hierarchy here at, uh, at government. But I think, it, I think it identifies that Siemens has had very strong leadership on the key issues around innovation, investment, and skills in the UK. And of course, that, uh, that's uh, 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 replicated there. So as an organization, we are very, very keen to demonstrate and get involved with STEM 
activities, because this goes right back into inspiring a generation, not just in the food and the packaging sector, but manufacturing across the area. So most of us are involved in STEM activities. We have a, if you go online and see the Curiosity Project by Siemens, it's a very much a, uh, uh, aimed at uh, uh, schools, teachers to actually put in the curriculum STEM activities, but manufacturing biased activities. I think that uh, is, a, uh, is, is fantastic really for, for those guys coming forward. UTCs, we're on the, the governors of, of most of the UTCs. We sponsor a lot of the UTCs going through. We absolutely are right behind that and various, if we drill into the, uh, some of the more specific um, colleges around dairy, we were active at Reeseith College and, and Sheffield Hallam. We, we work alongside Festo and a few others, Mark Whip, I think, with, with um, uh, at Sheffield Hallam University, which is the National Centre of Excellence for Food Engineering, that are trying to get engineers coming into the food sector uh, as, a, as a choice, as their first choice, as opposed to being trying off with a bit of automation, automotive and a bit of, bit of aerospace and then by default, because nobody else will have you, end up in the food sector. Uh, we want to try and get these guys coming through with the right skills and talents that are going to take us forward with the technology advancement. So there's quite a lot going on uh, that we're trying to do there, but it's all about how do we apply uh, Eliza mentioned about the perfect storm. It's also been hit very hard with the technology that's coming with this as well. So technology is really going to come at a pace uh, now. So around innovation, it needs to set that, that vision uh, and that investment in the, it, that supports that vision and making sure the skills, that, that the youngsters coming through, but the cross-training is coming through to, to assist that process. So if innovation is fantastic, where do we need to innovate? Um, the food sector is, is inherently uh, 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 lags a lot of other manufacturing sectors. Um, and so it's recognized, it's also recognized at a government level that it is absolutely important to the UK economy. It is the largest manufacturing sector um, out there. Uh, sometimes it doesn't feel like that, but it absolutely is. Um, but, and this was a, a 10 point plan that was worked with the Knowledge Transfer Network, Innovate UK and the Food and Drink Federation and its members to ascertain, well, if we are to innovate, if we're going to raise the bar as an organisation, as, as, as a sector, where are the, the most important parts to focus on? So some of these, you probably won't be able to see this in the back, but some of these, you know, technology companies like Siemens have a direct uh, impact on that. And that's the future of manufacturing. You know, if you we talk about agile, agility in the manufacturing process, really, really, really important. I'll talk about that in a minute in terms of how technology will assist in that process. But if you're starting to make things to order, which may be the way things are starting to go, as opposed to trying to make it to trends, then if you're making to order, then by default, your waste minimization, your reduction in energy, and your reduction in water will automatically start to happen. So some of these are a direct um, uh, relationship to technology, some are a, a byproduct of. But you can imagine a situation, if we're talking of a very ma uh, agile manufacturing basis that's very, very close to, the con close to the consumer, what the consumer requires, the demand from the consumer, the intelligent fridge that's suddenly going to tell you you're out of tomatoes or whatever, and, and the whole supply chain reacting to that, which, which we smile about. But actually, in John Lewis this week, I saw a Samsung fridge with exactly that situation. So it is starting to happen. But if to, to make that worthwhile, that means that the, so you're closer to the, the consumer, you means your, your, your retail sector has got to be integrated to all that, and your manufacturing and the machinery builders that are supplying the food factories are going to have to be, build machinery that is so modular that it can adapt to the, the changes and being close to the consumer. So things are happening quite quick, excuse me, quite quickly. But the important thing about this, no one company is going to make a difference to this. The only way this can happen is, is by collaboration. And pre-competitive collaboration in the food sector, or well, collaboration in the food sector isn't something that happens automatically. Certain other industries are a bit more open to, to collaboration. The automotive sector, the aerospace sector, uh, generally will collaborate to raise the bar of the technology and the way they perform, and then they put their own IP on top of that to make a difference. Of course, the food sector, where margins are very, very tiny, is a different sort of mentality and a different culture. But to make a difference, 
we're going to have to start thinking more about collaborating to, to, on the same common problems to raise the bar, to, to move ourselves forward. So, in terms of manufacturing, then bringing it closer to manufacturing, the key issues across all manufacturing is, is, is the same. It's productivity, agility, and efficiency. And of course, in the food sector, that again is a, 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 an area that we need to focus on. You know, productivity, we are basically, if it takes four days to produce a product in Germany, it takes five days in the UK. That's the, the criteria that we're up against. And we have to change that if we're going to make a, a, a changes forward. So what is going to change? What's suddenly going to make a difference? We're all working hard. We're all going to start to, we, 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 you know, we think we're doing as good as we can, and I'm sure we are. But what's going to make the difference if we're going to make these changes? Of course, this is what's going to change. Because in our everyday lives, we're inundated by digital information. You only get your phones out. You'd be probably, somebody's probably, and I, I, was, I was coming down on the train yesterday, and I got a, uh, a text uh, from, from, from the train line saying, your train's on time, it's on platform six, as indicated. And this information, without any prompting, is telling me where, where, what's happening. Industry, will, will, we can't, we can't uh, hide behind, this is what's gonna start to happen. This will change everything. And so we're going back to Eliza's, uh, the perfect storm. Of all the, the uncertainty that's going on, as well as the technology, uh, but we can use this as a way of actually helping us going forward. So we've talked about the potentials of in, in, uh, digitalization and, uh, uh, and Industry 4.0, the Internet of Things, the cyber physical systems, some great buzzwords, but what do they really mean? Um, just a matter of interest, is it, I assume everybody's heard the term Industry 4.0 before we... Uh, Mr. Show of hands, any Industry 4.0, everyone? Yeah, not too bad. Good. Excellent. Um, well, that's good. And also, I, uh, last week, uh, uh, Philip Hammond and indeed Jeremy Cor Corbyn also mentioned the term Industry 4.0. I'm not so sure they actually knew what it does or what it's going to do, but the fact they're actually talking about it and very much as part of their productivity funding uh, initiative, uh, I think, uh, I think that's, a, that's a good sign. So, in terms of a production line, trying to see what Industry 4.0 can start to, to do for us. You can imagine it's around data, really. That's the, that's the key thing. So product design will have a data model. So whether you're just producing the actual product itself, the ingredients list, the labeling, the artwork around that particular product, that will be captured in a data model. And what we're going to try and create is a virtual production facility, a virtual production line. And every part of that process increases its data model. And this becomes what we call the digital twin. So the digital twin basically is a pile of data. Every process will have a virtual uh, recording, a virtual blueprint. And machining will be no different. So when we do the, the production engineering or the production execution, we will know from a virtual reality the performance of the machinery that's going to deliver the certain OEE and the certain agility that that factory needs to produce as, as a, a complete virtual uh, model. And as, as we go forward with the sensors on that, that's reporting condition monitoring and all the technology that's going to go around to say things are about to fail before they do, that again is reporting back that data. And you're going to have a comparison between the virtual machine, the virtual uh, line, and the real line. And that comparison it leads to autonomy, it leads to autonomous. So the Google car is a great example of what exactly a living type of scenario where you send something on a journey and then outside influences are coming in, sensors are taking that, the analytics is being done on that, and then it's reacting autonomously to those conditions. Production lines will end up going down that route. Not today or tomorrow, but not far down there. We're working, you know, we, we think in terms of version control of where we are currently to where that the possible utopia is, is probably about, we're about three, version 3.7, uh, 3.8, that's so we're not far away. So, so, so these are the sort of things that are coming down. And, we, and then you, you turn that in a complete, complete uh, manufacturing environment where you're linking the product life cycle management of your particular product, you're designing your product, you're linking in the manufacturing execution systems, the manufacturing operations management of that. All this will be done uh, uh, through virtual 
reality. And of course, where, certainly where we are from a, an automation perspective, it has to be integrated. If it's not integrated, if it's not taking the data through, all this falls down. And so that's really, really important. And then the analytics can start to work out where we are compared to where we should be. Now, we could sit here and go, oh, the guy, it's never going to happen, is it, really? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit pie in the sky. Um, and and uh, it wouldn't be the first time, in fact, in the UK, we've not really grasped uh, technology at the first, first um, uh, hurdle, if you like. We're very good at innovating. What we're not very good at is applying it. Other countries apply it, and we need to start thinking about that because the race is on. This, uh, basically, an awful lot of, of investment is going on across the globe on this type of discussion. Um, and, and we really have to be part of that because the, the, the sheer facts are that Germany is 10 times light to automate than the UK. If we were to uh, uh, automate to the same levels as Japan, we would overnight be 22% more productive. And that wealth generation would generate 7% more jobs. If we were to uh, increase our digital footprint by 10%, that would lead to a 0.75% rise in per capita of GDP. So massive numbers that we have to grasp. So we talked about agility and what does that really mean? And you're thinking, well, if you're close to the consumer, does this idea of maybe getting to a, a, a mass customization is another word that is used in industry for terminology. What does that mean? I, can, I understand it a little bit in terms of the car, the, the automotive. You buy your vehicle, you set your trim level, you get your alloys, you're all excited, and six weeks later, your car comes up in a production line. Your neighbor's car was ordered at the same time, and that's, on the set, that's very next to yours down that production line. It's a customized vehicle uh, based on some certain criteria that the, the manufacturer is, 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 uh, is, is prompting you to choose. But what about the food industry? How can we actually get to a situation where somebody would order their own packet of crisps off a walker's line? and the very next day they get your Walker's crisps. I'm not so sure, really. But then you start to think what's going on out there. And uh, this wasn't anything clever. This isn't actually Industry 4.0 or anything really uh, uh, overly technical. This was a way how Coke managed to just get the 50 top names, shove a label on, and that grazed their, uh, their uh, uh, performance by 7%. They sold 7% more Coke because of this campaign. And the simple reason was, if you were Chris or Emma, you felt that was your, your bottle of Coke. You were actually going out there to choose your, your label, your labeled Coke, because you could interact, suddenly interacting with the product. The power that that gives marketeers is absolutely phenomenal. So Coke have started to do that. You can have, if you wish, you can have your, your M&Ms with your, your name, your photograph on, coming off the production line. Um, if you want to go... To Germany, you can get uh, my muesli. You can select the types of uh, characteristics of your muesli, and then the very next day, your muesli comes and gets delivered to you, your required situation. Coke, again, have done something this year where they did the AdFab movie. We spoke to a milk uh, processing company a, a few years back. Um, where they were trying to produce the head... wanted to do the headlines of the day on their milk. And, uh, and they technically could do it, uh, because obviously it starts to give a very, very strong vibe about that particular uh, delivery is today's delivery, because it's got the headlines. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't uh, change that. So it's great in terms of giving it that fresh freshness. The reason why this particular company didn't go with it was because they couldn't decide on the headlines. Because obviously, politically, you could actually be a big time getting it wrong if you have a slant in one part of the world compared to another part of the world. But you get the feel of what they're trying to do with this sort of stuff. This is a great one because every year or every time there's a big sporting event, um, there is a, a plethora of, of, uh, of uh, packaging that replicates that. And everybody's, I think, I think Muller did the, uh, the, uh, the Olympics this year. I'm not too sure who, who, who got the Euro. But uh, just to give you an example, um, post-Brexit, I was at a food and drink uh, uh, event and uh, uh, Tesco's were there and they were asked the question, uh, is Brexit having an impact on their business? And it was quite early days, so they'd obviously hedged the currency, so that wasn't necessarily a, necessarily a big problem. Um, but what they did say was, what's really crippled them is Euro 2016 
uh, and England's dire performance uh, in that particular tournament. And the reason being was all they've got a shop full of, of England flags and all their products. Um, and the thing was, nobody wants it after that. So nobody wants to buy anything with the England flag. It wasn't quite the same story where you had a Welsh flag on, I have to say. But, uh, but, it, but the England flag, nobody wants to buy the product. So you've suddenly got to do something with all this product. And the key issue is they know exactly when the tournament is, but they can't react in tournament. So the supply chain is not responsive enough to actually react. So you're left with a pile of products that nobody wants because you've just made on the basis that, well, maybe they will do have a good run this year and there'll be enough in the supply chain. And that brings this agility piece right back down to it, down to the, 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 the issue. A lot of the times we've always been at a PPMA event, we've always said that the reason why companies don't innovate or don't in, uh, invest in automation is because the retailers have a stranglehold of the, of the, of the sector. Long, the contracts aren't long enough to make a difference. The big four rule the roost. The game's changing. So the big four don't rule the roost anymore. They're growing at sort of zero-ish, zero to just about plus, some of them some bit minus retail sectors. The growing sectors are your Lidl's, your Aldi, and online. That's where the growth is. So if you're thinking about Amazon suddenly changing the way the market or we purchase products, suddenly, if you're at the front of a PC or your phone and you're ordering things, you've got the ability to input data, input what you want into that supply chain and get it, get it delivered the next day. That will change things dramatically and we won't be able to stop this. And, and therefore, companies like yourselves are in this packaging machine. It's a great opportunity, really, to start to think about how you can make it more modularized, how you can get your machinery that's hooked up on data to make a difference to, uh, to this sector going forward. So data is absolutely key. It can, it's, a, it's key to improving continuous improvement for the, about your processes. It's key to understand how you're all individually performing to your leadership, your management team. It's all about data uh, as, we, as we go forward. And just to come into a, towards the end here now, this is very, very similar to a lot of things that goes on in, in manufacturing. You know, how can you get data out of discrete machines on a production line? And that's why it's really, really important as we go forward that standardized data interfaces start to appear across all the machines on the production line. So those machines, even though they're bought to do a particular task, a discrete task, so many bottles a minute, so many fills per second, whatever the term was going to be, but it can't no longer be supplied just as a discrete machine. It has to interface to a production line because that's the only way the return on investment of that automation is going to be in a situation where, where this can uh, uh, move us dramatically forward. Only 30% of assets are networked. Uh, and, you know, the different ways of getting the data out there, so data analytics can be done in the cloud, and that's really where that's going to start to go in the, in the forms of time. All, most of our gear coming next year will be automatically linked into a cloud environment. This is what's uh, going to start to uh, be, be a common thing. So, just to finish off, these are the things that are going to change dramatically, and it's about how the leadership team of every business and this goes right up to government as well. Government has got to set the agenda in terms of the vision of this because discreetly we can't make a big difference, but if we're all following the same path supported by government, that's going to make a, a fantastic difference to how we, uh, we go forward. So on that note, I thank you very much for listening. <laughs>